All right, welcome to our second episode in our series, uh, How Austrian Economics Impacted My Life. That's the thesis of the conference. Uh, the idea, of course, is to get people exposed to the personal side of Austrian economics. I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and uh, we're the sponsor of this conference. And rather than have just a dry series of academic-oriented talks on Austrian economics that might tend to put people to sleep. We wanted to do something more like People Magazine type thing, where uh, some of the stars of the Austrian economics movement talked about how they discovered Austrian economics, the impact it's had on their lives, some of the important principles and figures and uh, books and articles and speeches and so forth that impacted their life. So we had last week, we had our first speaker, Ben Powell. That, that talk is now on our website at fff.org. And uh, now we got the real honor and pleasure of having one of the real stars of both the libertarian movement and Austrian economics, and that's Mark Skousen. Uh, I came across Mark Skousen many, many years ago, right after I discovered libertarianism and Austrian economics in the late 1970s. I, uh, uh, soon after I discovered the, the libertarian movement, I discovered the hard money movement. And Mark was part of that, and it was really exciting. I, I went to a big investment conference in New Orleans, the Jim Blanchard conference where Ayn Rand was giving the keynote speech and Mark was there. And this was this was the real heyday of hard money, uh, the hard money movement. And then I subscribed to Mark's newsletter, Forecasts and Strategies, where I just learned un an unbelievable amount of Austrian economics. Uh, and as y'all know, I mean, this is a guy that does not need any introduction to anybody in the libertarian movement. I mean, he is I think the greatest philosophical entrepreneur in the history of the libertarian movement. Uh, he's the organizer of Freedom Fest. I think probably most of you have been to Freedom Fest. It's just this gigantic uh, festival of libertarians, conservatives, uh, dozens, if not hundreds of speeches, sessions, concurrent sessions. I mean, it's just an absolutely fantastic intellectual in, an enjoyable experience. If you've never gone, I highly recommend it. He normally has it in Las Vegas. I think next time is going to be in Vegas next summer. It's usually in about around July. Last year it was in Memphis. But what some of you may not know is that Mark wears two hats. He's also one of the real prominent, renowned scholars of Austrian economics. And uh, Richard Ebeling, who y'all know uh, does the Libertarian Angle with me, has spoken so highly of Mark. He told me, he says, Mark is right there at the top in terms of Austrian scholars. And he's published many books, um, including his, I think his most famous, The Structure of Production, but many others, and of course, many investment books. And uh, he's done countless speeches, lectures, and I think he's probably the most entertaining speaker in, in the libertarian movement. So, Mark, it's just a real honor. Thank you very much for agreeing to do this. Take it away. Well, Bumper, a uh, real pleasure. And thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, that's uh, that's probably the, the most complimentary introduction I've ever had. So <laughs> I thank you very much for that. And uh, my publicity people are very excited about your uh, endorsement. Uh, about uh, my being a, the libertarian entrepreneur of the century or whatever it might be. Um, so what I thought I would do to make this as interesting as possible is I came up with 11 episodes in my life where Austrian economics played a very important role. And so uh, I'll start off by saying that as a teenager, uh, episode number one is... Uh, my father had a copy of Human Action by Ludwig von Mises in his library. We grew, I grew up in Portland, Oregon, a family of 10 uh, uh, active Mormons uh, in Portland. My father was an FBI agent and then became a family lawyer. So he was very much involved in the conservative movement from the very beginning with his, uh, his older brother, Cleon Skousen. And uh, so he had on this shelf, human action. So that was the first uh, exposure I had to Austrian economics, even before an introduction to Milton Friedman or Ayn Rand, for that matter, it was, it was Ludwig von Mises. 
But I have to tell you that uh, Human Action was a very tough slug for a teenager to read, believe me. When you get into Pax, Plax, uh, Praxology and, and the philosophy, uh, he starts with the first 100 pages. It's really heavy reading. And I have to be honest with you, uh, German, even in English, still sounds German to me. And it really didn't do a lot for me. So that was my first exposure. So now we move to episode number two. Uh, our family, my father passed away when I was uh, 16 and uh, he died of lung cancer at age 46. Never smoked his entire life, but somehow developed lung cancer. And so he left his widow, my mother's 39, uh, to raise 10 children. And so, we moved to Provo, Utah in my senior year, and then I started going to BYU. And it was there at BYU that even though the textbook was Paul Samuelson's Economics, which is the premier Keynesian textbook, I mean, I was really in shock that as uh, active Mormons, they would be supporting uh, uh, this Keynesian philosophy of uh, that deficits are okay, you can run uh, deficits indefinitely, that big government is good, progressive taxation is great, we need to get off the gold standard. I mean, thrift is bad, the paradox of thrift. You look at all of the things that Keynesian economics uh, uh, has as a policy, according to Paul Samuelson, and you say, this doesn't make a lot of sense. So I was naturally uh, fascinated with economics uh, and wanted to major in it. But, uh, you know, you talk about what the impact that Austrian economics has on our lives. So I was always a truth seeker. To me, the whole purpose of life is to seek truth and then to follow it. So truth can be elusive because you hear both sides. Uh, you see multiple views, many different religions, many different philosophies of life, uh, many different uh, uh, schools of thought in economics. So which is the best one? So I was always in search of the best philosophy. Not that one would particularly have a monopoly on the truth, but I wanted to get to the one that had the closest to the truth. So my first exposure after Ludwig von Mises was with um, Milton Friedman and George Stigler because uh, we, I had two uh, professors at BYU, one Larry Wimmer in particular, who, uh, uh, who was for, uh, had a PhD uh, from University of Chicago under Milton Friedman. And so I, he introduced me to capitalism and freedom. And that was a real breakthrough in my mind. I really was uh, caught up in uh, Friedmanite economics, but I still felt like uh, there was a lot missing in the Chicago School of Economics. So I continued to search and I came across a book, see if I can pull it up here, um, that that uh, was, was very interesting called Views, Views of Capitalism, Views on Capitalism. And it had, Across the political spectrum, uh, it had the views of uh, Milton Friedman, John Kenneth Galbraith, Paul Samuelson, John Maynard Keynes, Karl Marx, uh, the whole list, Robert Heilbronner, uh, author of The Worldly Philosophers, uh, Thorsten Veblen. I mean, they're all in here. But what was interesting was after Milton Friedman, there was this little essay by Murray Rothbard, and Murray Rothbard introduced me. It was called uh, uh, The Great Society, a Libertarian Critique. And even though he was introduced as an extreme right-wing fanatic, mini perspective kind of thing, I was immediately drawn in because Rothbard writes like he speaks the truth. And he comes across as very convincing. And he's also the first Austrian-American who actually wrote English that everybody could understand. Gary North always made that point. He said the reason Murray Rothbard would never win the Nobel Prize is because he speaks plain English, and you have to be very convoluted, and difficult to understand, uh, like Keynes, uh, to to win the no Nobel Prize. But in any case, uh, I was really taken with Rothbard, and that led to a series of Rothbard readings, including uh, let's see here if I can pull out. This book here, What Has the Government Done to Our Money? To me, this is to Austrians what, uh, what uh, the Communist Manifesto is to the Marxists. 
this is so, you know, there's always this mystery of money. Do we really understand how money and Rothbard was the first person who, in my opinion, really resonated and explained what money was all about. So that was really great. And of course, that was followed by, if I can find another one of his books. I don't see it right here, but the other one is uh, The Great Depression, uh, Rothbard's views on the Great Depression. And then, of course, uh, this book right here, this huge tome that I found in a John Birch Society bookstore, uh, Man, Economy, and State by Murray Rothbard, big, thick book. And I took it on my honeymoon. I married my wife, Joanne, who, by the way, we've celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary this year. So uh, Joanne has had a lot of influence in my life. And I took this on our uh, <laughs> on our honeymoon. It naturally didn't get very far through the book, but uh, uh, it's always had a uh, nice uh, resonance with me. And I had Murray Rothbard sign it. And if you've ever had Murray Rothbard's signature on this book, he says, uh, uh, to man, economy, and against the state was the way he put it. So those are some of the things that really got me into uh, Austrian economics was Rothbard, starting with that little essay, uh, critique, a, a libertarian critique of the great society. Um, so now we move to uh, episode number three, episode number three, and that is under the influence of Murray Rothbard. I got my PhD at George Washington University through the CIA, my very first job uh, out of after graduating from BYU uh, was uh, uh, to work for the CIA as an economist. The uh, CIA is into everything. And so economic analysis is extremely important because you need to know the strength and weaknesses of a nation uh, as you uh, try to determine whether they're militarily capable to win or lose a war. Economics is extremely important. So I was on the Brazil desk, and while I was there, I, I did my night work at George Washington University. And I got my PhD in 1977, and my uh, work was called the, uh, the Economics of a Pure Gold Standard, which has been published uh, by the Mises Institute and by the Foundation for Economic Education. Uh, basic, basically, a, a book that uh, looked at the pros and cons of the gold standard. And so that was my introduction to uh, the gold bug movement, the hard money movement, if you will, because uh, after three years of working or two and a half years working for the CIA, I decided it was not for me. It was too bureaucratic. So I applied for a job uh, and got a job through Bob Kephart, who was the publisher of Human Events in Washington, D.C., and so I started working in the private sector, writing for an investment newsletter called the Inflation Survival Letter. And so that gets us into uh, episode uh, number, uh, well, let me, yeah, so I, I think I covered everything that I started writing. I became a financial economist. I have my PhD in economics. By the way, I, I got a master's, I got a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a PhD in economics. Uh, uh, and never took a class in personal finance, accounting, or business management. Can you imagine? That's how narrowly focused economics was back in the day. It may well be still even today. This is one of the things that I've really tried to do in my economics. If you look at my textbook, Economic Logic, if you look at the making of modern economics, I introduce a lot of people who are kissing cousins to economics, like Peter Drucker, uh, just as an example, uh, who uh, came up with privatization. It was an Austrian, uh, but more not an economist, but more a, a management guru. Uh, but somebody who needs to be uh, put on the list of important people to read uh, in Austrian economics. So uh, to me, uh, it was really valuable to get into the private sector and find out what economics is all about and to balance a budget and to hire and fire people and to uh, uh, make payroll. Uh, I developed all those abilities. And, and one of the things that really hel helped me in my book, Economic Logic, my economic textbook, is I'm, I'm the only one who starts with the P&L profit and loss income statement. No economics per, uh, textbook does this except I do. 
And the reason is, is because none of these academics had any business experience. They haven't run a business. So that the P&L statement is maybe in the uh, appendix of one of their chapters, but I bring it up front and center uh, to demonstrate the dynamics of the uh, economic system. And I think it fits very nicely into Austrian, Austrian economics. So uh, that's one of my contributions to economics is to add the P&L statement in the textbooks. Nobody else has imitated me on that yet, but uh, that's what makes my textbook economic logic a, uh, I don't know if I have a copy of that here or not, but anyway, uh, uh, one of one of many uh, textbooks and books that I've written over the years. Okay, so let's move to episode number four. And uh, Bumper and Bart, let me know uh, how I'm doing on time because we do want to allow for questions. So if you have questions, I assume, Bart, you're handling the questions and you will ask questions uh, at the end of my presentation. Is that correct? Yeah, Mark, you're doing perfectly fine on time. Take as much time as you want. And uh, for the listeners, there's a Q&A button at the bottom. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you do have a question for Mark, just hit that Q&A button there and submit your question. Okay, fantastic. Thanks. So episode number four is, uh, I really, my first introduction to Wall Street was investing in, in fact, I have in my pocket, my very first investment, the silver dollar, not a stock or a bomb, but a silver dollar. So I was into alternative investing right from the very beginning um, in the 70s, in the inflationary 70s. And I wrote, a managing, I was managing editor of an investment newsletter called the Inflation Survival Letter. So we had personal finance, survival techniques, uh, uh, freeze-dried food, all of this kind of stuff, and buying gold and silver and guns and real estate and Swiss bank accounts. And I mean, it was really rock and roll and very little on stocks and bonds. Yes, gold stocks in particular, uh, South African gold shares, a uh, very big deal. So that was my introduction to finance was this alternative, whole alternative gold bug, hard money movement. And I, like, like Bumper, I, I attended one of the very first uh, Jim Blanchard conferences, New Orleans conference uh, that was held annually and is a gold bug haven. And in fact, I've been, te I've been lecturing there for like 40 some years now, and I'll be headed there at the end of this month uh, in New Orleans again. Uh, but in 1980, uh, I had a break with the hard money movement. I was kind of excommunicated in some ways uh, because Ronald Reagan was elected president in 1980. And so we had this very big conference at New Orleans at that time. This is before Ayn Rand showed up there. But th there were thousands of people there. It was the biggest conference they ever had because Reagan had won. And I was really shocked that all the gold bug people were not happy that Reagan had won. They said, no, nothing's going to change. Still going to be huge deficits. Government's only going to get bigger. Inflation is going to rage. Gold and silver is going to hit the roof and all this sort of thing. And I've always believed, know the signs of the times. And this was a paradigm shift. Uh, and sure enough, after... Actually, it took a couple of years, but 1982, the bottom of the, the market had reached bottom. Uh, gold and silver had topped out and began a long secular bear market. And meanwhile, stocks and bonds just took off, and we went through a 40-year bull market in stocks and bonds. And so I was one of the very few uh, in the hard money movement who recognized uh, this change. And when I look at the Austrian theory of the business cycle, which I'd studied under Hayek, uh, prices and production, and especially the uh, this book here, which I think is Mises' best book from a financial point of view, the theory of money and credit. This was a very significant book in my life, and especially with the development of the Austrian theory of the business cycle and uh, Menger's uh, theory of the structure of production and so forth. Uh, this this was uh, Mises' theory of money and credit was instrumental in that respect. But I noticed in the Austrian theory of the business cycle, there's both a boom and a bust. And of course, the boom is supposedly artificial and so can't last. And so this is why the Austrians always fo focus on, well, the bull market has to come to an end. The 
The booming economy has to turn to a bust and a depression. It's inevitable. We don't know exactly when it is, but it's going to come. And as a result, they tend to be what we call perma bears in the financial markets. Uh, and you see this all the time. And Murray Rothbard was one of them. He was ne he never warmed up to uh, Reagan. Uh, he he never saw the value of Reaganomics. Uh, and I saw it as marginal analysis. If there's one thing you learn from the Austrian School of Economics is a change occurs on a marginal basis. And what was the marginal change? Supply side economics. Uh, so you had tax cuts. You didn't eliminate taxes. You just cut taxes. You didn't eliminate government regulations. You reduced them. And that's all it takes to create a bull market on Wall Street and an economic boom. And it lasted for a long period of time. And the bull markets and the boom phase is lasting a lot longer than the bear phase and the boom and the bust phase. So I think this is one area where Austrian economics kind of missed the boat in the, in the focus on being super bearish all the time. Uh, I, I meet, I still meet them. I mean, Doug Casey is an example, Gary North, uh, Howard Ruff, uh, Jim Blanchard, uh, they all fit into this category of perma bears, uh, predicting a uh, terrible uh, apocalyptic end. And of course, there's many Christians uh, who, who are in that category, end of the world scenarios and so forth. So it's something that I've fought against uh, most of my career. <clears throat> and so I, I'm a little bit, <clears throat> a little bit different than the uh, traditional traditional point of view here. Let me get something here to drink here. <clears throat> All right, so I switched from gold and silver. I wrote a promotional copy called uh, for my newsletter, Forecasts and Strategies, which by the way, I started in 1980, the year Ronald Reagan was elected, called Forecasts and Strategies. So I forecast, and then I give a strategy. And so I wrote my first promotion for the copy uh, for my newsletter. Uh, outside of the envelope said, uh, the financial shock of 1981, open up and see what it is. So you open it up and it says, Reaganomics will work, sell your gold and silver and buy stocks and bonds. Now, that was a great prophecy, a great prediction that turned out to be true, but the promotion bombed completely because nobody believed me in 1981 that that was recession, uh, that the, the we we're now going to have an economic boom. We're going to have a stock market recovery and gold and silver are going to be in a bear market and interest rates are going to come down and so forth. Nobody believed me on that. But it was the beginning of my my uh, career as a newsletter writer. And I've been writing now forecasts and strategies for 43 years. I think I have a copy of it right here that uh, Bumper mentioned. Uh, it may look yellow, but I like to think of it as gold. It's gold, folks. <laughs> Okay, so uh, that brings us to episode number five. I stayed in, even though I was kind of more traditional at this point in my newsletter, uh, I still rep uh, understood my roots. I was still close friends with Murray Rothbard and became involved with the Mises Institute. I sponsored a number of conferences and uh, I actually, in, in 1980, contacted Murray Rothbard and said, I'll pay you $20,000 advance to write an alternative to Robert Heilbronner's book, The Worldly Philosophers. And uh, Heilbronner's favorite <clears throat> economists were, of course, Marx and Keynes and Veblen. And I wanted someone who said, no, no, it's Adam Smith and, and uh, it's the... Uh, French laissez-faire school, and it's the Austrian school and the Chicago school, and I thought Murray would be the per perfect person to write this. Little did I know that he didn't like the Chicago school. He didn't like Adam Smith, uh, and, and that kind of shocked me when I found that out because his famous, infamous chapter 16, the celebrated Adam Smith in his History of Thought book, is totally contrary to Ludwig von Mises' view. Uh, Mises was, uh, and, and uh, Rothbard, uh, or Mises is Rothbard's uh, mentor. And yet uh, Mises has written a grand introduction to a, a regnery edition of The Wealth of Nations, uh, extolling the virtues of Adam Smith and The Wealth of Nations. So I think I'm very much <laughs> in the original tradition of the Austrian school there. and and, uh, and and Murray is a little bit of the enfant terrible. Uh, so that was, uh, but but 
I still wanted Murray to write this book, and he ended up writing half of it, getting, getting through Marx, but never finishing the rest because he died, as you know, in 1995. Um, so very much involved with there. But that means that brings us to episode number six for me was the writing of my magnum opus, The Structure of Production, which I have right here, The Structure of Production, which came out in 1990, published by NYU Press. And it's kind of my magnum opus, uh, my uh, technical work in economics. And there is in chapter six, a very important section on gross output saying uh, GDP is an incomplete measure. It leaves out the value of the supply chain and leads to all kinds of mischief, like consumer spending drives the economy and so forth. So it was in that 1990 structure book that I introduced the idea of gross output, which has been adopted since 2014 by the federal government. Uh, I met with uh, uh, Hayek in 1985. And what's interesting about my gross output statistic is that it's a measure of Hayek's triangles. So those of you who are familiar with Austrian economics and his book, Prices and Production, I think I have a copy of the, of, uh, uh, I have a copy of Prices and Production, the very first edition right here, pristine copy. And uh, in it, he develops this idea of the structure of production and stages of production. And I think more than any other economist, I've really developed that stages of production model in my textbook, Economic Logic, and in other uh, writings that I've done. If you go to my website, grossoutput.com, you can see all what I've done there to develop this concept. It's a paradigm shift, and and I, I, I've gotten numerous rejection letters from uh, the American Economic Association and some of their journals. Uh, it's really been a long slog, and yet the federal government, here they are, measuring Hayek's triangles. It's just truly amazing. It's kind of restored my faith in government. I know you don't want to hear that bumper, but uh, it's... Uh, it's surprising how well it's been received by the government uh, in putting together this gross output statistic uh, and compared to the lukewarm reception I've received from the economics department, including from GMU, uh, George Mason University does not seem to, uh, they, they act like they're lukewarm to the idea of gross output. So it's a major disappointment in, in my career. But nevertheless, uh, I met with Hayek, uh, Gary North and I interviewed him for three hours. Uh, uh, if you look at the little book, Hayek on Hayek, there's quite a bit of our um, uh, our interview in that book without attribution for some reason. Uh, but Hayek himself told me that he was so pleased to see someone who had uh, uh, resurrected his prices in production and his Hayek's triangles and uh, putting some um, meat on the bones, so to speak. I also met with Sir John Hicks, who had written a uh, book on Austrian economics. Uh, so he had kind of switched from Keynesian to Austrian economics, and he was very much pleased with what I've done with the structure of production. So that uh, brings me to episode number seven. Uh, this is where, uh, while I was uh, doing conferences with the uh, Mises Institute, that I had a break with some of what I would regard as uh, uh, some of the extremist uh, Austrians who are the pure anarchists, uh, bumper, I don't know, you might be one of them, uh, as an uh, anar anarcho-capitalist, but uh, I've always been in the Mises Hayek uh, part of the Austrian school of limited government. Uh, government does have uh, certain uh, vital, legitimate roles to play but needs to be limited and, and controlled for sure. Um, so uh, I had some run-ins with Hans Hermann Hoppe, who as many of you may have in the past. Uh, he made some statements. I, I put on this conference uh, at Harvard University called anti Keynes at Harvard. And uh, so it was at that conference where I had kind of a break with uh, Hans Hoppe, who said things like, uh, money has nothing to do with interest rates which seemed absolutely bizarre to me. And there need not be any unemployment uh, uh, during a Great Depression. And that's very much contrary to what Mises said. Mises always said it would take a long time uh, for the, uh, the uh, malinvestments to work their way through the system. Uh, there's nothing automatic 
that immediately eliminates the malinvestment. So I think I'm in good solid ground, uh, my being a Misesian, Hayekian, uh, rather than, uh, than the uh, Hoppy, Rothbard type of uh, uh, division. Um, so uh, Murr, as I mentioned before, is also very anti-Reagan, never understood the benefits of Reagan economics. And then I started reading more of Rothbard's uh, criticism of foreign policy, where he said the U.S. was more of a danger than, than communist Russia. I had issues with that. And I, I have to admit, I have serious problems about his, his history book, Conceived in Liberty, where he bashes George Washington and Ben Franklin and some of the some of the greats uh, of our founding fathers. And uh, so that's just a cursory comment. But I, I just wanted to say that uh, while I had great admiration and love of Rothbard's economics. Uh, I have problems with his uh, other arguments on history and so forth. And look, we all have those kind of issues. We don't agree 100% with everybody. Uh, I'm a, search, a true seeker. And so I go to one individual and I say, well, I like what this person has to say, but maybe I don't like some of the other things that he has to say. You have to take individual choice there. And that, that's true in religion. That's true in philosophy. That's true in marriage and so forth. Now, everything isn't 100% perfect, right? All right, so get me to episode number eight, Rothbard versus Mises on Adam Smith. So after Rothbard wrote his two-volume set on the history of thought, which I commissioned, um, and he didn't finish his book, he did not do a, a, a uh, alternative to Heilbronner. He wrote more of a Schumpeterian tome thousand pages on the history of thought going all the way back to the Greeks. So I decided maybe at this point with my own background, it's time that I could write a history of thought. And But I was still heavily under the influence of Murray Rothbard. And so my first chapter on Adam Smith was similar to Rothbard's, a very critical view of Adam Smith who's taking economics down the wrong road and so forth. And I took that chapter out to my uncle, my wise uncle, Cleon, and I said, so what do you, would you take a look at this uh, chapter I've written? And he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, you know, it's interesting that the Adam, the Adam Smith invisible hand doctrine is inspired of God. And when he said that, it just shocked me. And I said, wow, uh, maybe I'm taking the wrong road here in attacking Adam Smith. So I decided there's only one way to find out. And what I did was I set aside a, couple of months and I read The Wealth of Nations cover to cover by Adam Smith. And when I was finished, I put the book down and I said, I hate to say it, but my uncle is right and Murray Rothbard, my economic mentor is wrong. Adam Smith is, is a great economist. And there's many libertarian statements uh, that, that Murray ignored in The Wealth of Nations. It is a difficult book and, and it, you can find anything you want in, in The Wealth of Nations. That's for sure. The Marxists find things and stuff like that. But overall, I think it's a grand book. And so I'm, again, in the Mises Hayek tradition in support of Adam Smith, as was was Carl Menger, by the way. Carl Menger said when he wrote the Grunsatz, the Principles of Economics, in 18, published in 1871, that he felt he was not tearing down the Adam Smith, the house that Adam Smith built, but he was just improving upon it with the marginal analysis and so forth. And he wrote with a frenzy. And I'm a big fan of Menger. And, and I just did a paper for uh, the special for Jesus Huerta de Soto, uh, arguing that Carl Menger is the greatest uh, theoretical economist that we've ever had because he formed the foundation of microeconomics with marginal analysis and macroeconomics with the structure of production. So that's an article that I've written that has just recently been, been published. Um, OK, so. As a result of that, my episode number eight ends with the development and the publication of the wealth of, uh, of the making of modern economics, which is now in its fourth edition, published by Rutledge. Uh, and as you can see, who's on the cover, Adam Smith, he's the heroic figure. So 
my decision to go with Adam Smith totally transformed my history of economics. I think it's a radical departure from all other histories of economics, which before was just a hodgepodge of this economist said this and this economist says that. Who knows what the truth is? Let's move on to the next economist. There was no running plot. There was no hero. There's no good ending. And that all changed with my book, Adam Smith and his system of natural liberty become the heroic, uh, the hero. Uh, and he comes under attack by the Marxists and Keynesians and, uh, and, and socialists. He's defended and brought back to life by the French school, the Austrian school, the Chicago school, the supply siders. And it's got a good ending with the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the Soviet central model system. So I'm very proud of this book, The Making of Modern Economics. And what's interesting is the very first edition came out on March 9th, March 9th, 2001. This went through lots of editions and lots of changes and stuff like that. So why is March 9th really important? Turns out that March 9th is the official pub date of the Wealth of Nations in 1776. So it's the exact pub date that I have for my making of modern economics. So I do, I do feel that I was inspired to talk to my uncle, to read what Mises had to say about Adam Smith and to change my view. So uh, that's, that's my approach. Uh, I think I'm very much in the Austrian tradition in, in, that, in, that, uh, in that regard. So that brings us to episode number nine. We're moving along very rapidly. And I decided that it was time for me to write an, a textbook in economics, uh, economic logic. It's now in its sixth edition, be coming out next month, uh, published by uh, Capital Press and Regnery. Starts with the PL statement. I call it the squaring of the Mises circle because I integrate Austrian economics and gross output and structure of production in a traditional economics textbook that includes GDP. So it's still in there. I'm not replacing it. It's just uh, uh, geos complementary. So take a look at uh, economic logic. Uh, by the way, I've mentioned a number of my books. If you go to skousenbooks.com, skousenbooks.com, you can see all the various various books that are that that are currently in print that I've written that you may want to take a look at and to see what I've done on that. So that brings us to episode number 10. So uh, I've lived in, uh, I've traveled to 77 countries. I've lived in six. Uh, I've been teaching uh, at Rollins College. And then uh, in uh, the year 2001, uh, right before the 9-11 events and so on, I was made president of FEE, the Foundation for Economic Education that was founded by Leonard Reed in 1946. And uh, I found it a, a great honor to be chosen to be the president of FEE, longstanding tradition. And, you know, Hans Senholtz was a longtime friend of mine, president of FEE, and I, and I had met Leonard Reed and, uh, and Larry Reed and and Richard Ebling and, and uh, Don Boudreau and all these people who had been presidents of FEE uh, either before me or after me. So it was a great pleasure. I only lasted a year because I was not very good at fundraising. Uh, the board had a different view, vision than I did. But one of the things I did as the president of FEE, I decided to be entrepreneur as, as Bumper talked about. And I decided, well, what can I do to jumpstart FEE and get it become as, uh, uh, as famous as Cato or Heritage that had kind of replaced Feed and the Freeman, their publication. And I said, well, let's do a national convention and we'll bring all the free market think tanks, the Cato's and Heritage and Reason. And uh, let's, let's put on a, a, a national conference. Nobody's ever done this before of the libertarian movement. Let's have a national conference. So it was called Fee Fest, and we had it in Las Vegas, the most libertarian city. And I don't know if Bumper, you were there or not, but we had 850 people there. And Ben Stein was our keynote speaker. We had Nathaniel Brandon there and Charles Murray. Now, lots of really great people and all the think tanks came and we just had a great time. And I thought this would be the beginning of uh, Fee Fest every year. And uh, so anyway, I lasted one year <laughs> as the president. I didn't like the direction I was going to, but I decided to keep Freedom Fest going. And in 2007, we started the first Freedom Fest, Inc., for profit, we are not nonprofit. I have some issues with with all these nonprofits. You know, I'm sure uh, uh, 
the bumper, your uh, FFF is a nonprofit, but uh, I, don't do any, I don't do any fundraising. Uh, you pay a price to come to my conference. Uh, it's very much a market approach, one price for each person. And uh, we put on a, like, like uh, Bumper says, a really fun conference every year in Vegas, or we now do every other city, uh, another city. So we've been to Memphis, we've been to South, uh, South Dakota, and we have several thousand people come every year. And it's just really a great experience. And in fact, I have to put a shout out to uh, Bumper's uh, standing room only sellout uh, breakout session on the JFK assassination. That was uh, pretty uh, pretty impressive, and that's the kind of thing I like to see uh, at at Freedom Fest, where you you, you get information and stuff uh, that you don't get uh, elsewhere. So uh, so Bob, keep coming up with uh, those good ideas for the conference. Uh, so as a result of my leaving fee, I stayed in New York. Joanne and I spent the next twenty years in New York. Um, we got uh, and. And so I actually ended up because of uh, uh, my leaving fee, I ended up teaching at Columbia Business School and Columbia University, the top one of the top Ivy League schools in the country. And that lasted for a couple of years. And then Joanna and I got the opportunity to teach at Sing Sing Penitentiary, not as inmates, but as uh, as uh, teachers. And that was an incredible experience to uh, face uh, uh, maximum security prison inmates who would, are in there for murder or worse, but they wanted to change their lives and improve their lives. And uh, this is a four-year college degree program. Uh, great, uh, great people that had changed their lives moved, and, and over a thousand have now left the institution. The, the recidivism rate is under uh, under what two percent right now. It's an incredible rate. My uh, son Tim uh, did a documentary. The uh, uh, on the University of Sing Sing that HBO put out, uh, if you want to take a look at that, uh, and 0% was uh, his original title, but uh, we had a wonderful experience there. And then finally, I've gotten this opportunity to teach at Chapman University, and I uh, always as an adjunct, I always taught one class a semester, but I got an opportunity to teach out at Chapman. And Chapman's a unique university. Everybody should go there and check it out. It's kind of like Hillsdale College. And you have statues there of, of Ayn Rand and Ronald Reagan and Milton Friedman. And uh, it's really quite quite something. And I teach there uh, half of the year and my wife teaches English uh, literature and poetry. So it's really a, a great school and I'm proud to be a part of it. And last year I was appointed the first Doty Spogley a chair of free enterprise at Chapman University. So adjunct does good. I'm no longer just an adjunct. I now hold a uh, endowed chair. So I'm Really proud of uh, what I've been able to do there, and they they are very supportive with uh, Jim Doty, the former president, Daniele Strupa, and and others. So, really very pleased with that. And uh, so, that's really everything I had to say. Although uh, episode number eleven, I see, says Freedom Fest, the for profit. We have already talked about that, so I've covered uh, all of that, and and. By the way, uh, I, I should add that during that entire uh, period, uh, my wife and I have been married for 50 years. We have five wonderful children and we have eight grandchildren scattered all over the country. And we have traveled the world together. Uh, we've lived in Washington, D.C., which we call Death Star. And we moved there to the Bahamas for two years, Life in Living Color. I have a little essay on that. Uh, my website, my personal website, by the way, is mscousin dot com if you want to read some articles about my career and my involvement in my life and so forth my various books um, and then after two years in the bahamas we saved enough in taxes to buy a flat in london so we spent a lot of time in europe uh, then we moved back uh, to the states and and uh, lived in orlando i taught at rollins college we were there for 15 or 20 years and we still have our home in fact, the home that I'm speaking from is our home in Winter Park in Orlando. Uh, and so I've, we've kept that uh, property. But then we moved to New York. We lived in New York for 20 years. And then we sold our home in New York during the pandemic. And we have a home out in California. So we switched back and forth between East and West Coast and had just had a, a wonderful time uh, traveling the world and uh, 
meeting lots of different people. I get an itch to travel quite frequently. And I love particularly uh, teaching at universities. Uh, I've been, I've taught at, I've given lectures at over a hundred universities and I'll be a member of the Mount Pelerin Society for a long time. I'll be going to their meeting in Bretton Woods. Uh, I'll be giving some lectures at Hillsdale College, uh, many other universities and colleges and trying to promote gross output and other uh, free market economics. Uh, I've given a number of lectures recently on Adam Smith. This is his 300th anniversary. And I actually gave a lecture on the anniversary of his birth, June 5th, uh, this year, he was born in uh, uh, 1723 on uh, June 5th. So I was in uh, the Palmer House and uh, actually purchased uh, one of the first editions of the Wealth of Nations. So that's on uh, display at the Pannier House in Edinburgh. And I gave a lecture there. But I am really concerned that a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, economists have lost uh, a, a proper understanding of Adam Smith. So I've written a number of articles on that. I'll be giving a lecture at Hillsdale College in early November called The Genius of Adam Smith. So I'll uh, be taking on some of the critics. Uh, so uh, anyway, I think that you, I think you get a sense that uh, out of all the schools of economics, I did write a book called Vienna and Chicago, Friends or Foes, comparing the Austrian school with the Chicago school. And I, I tended to make both of them mad because I have, uh, there's four major areas of differences between the Austrian and Chicago school. And I have, uh, I gave, support to two of them in the Austrian school. And then I gave support for two of them in the Chicago school. So I have a feed in both of them. I found truth in both of them. But probably if I had my choice, uh, Austrian economics has more truth than any other school of thought. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. All right, Mark, absolutely fantastic talk. Just great presentation. This is just exactly what we had in mind. The personal account the intellectual account, the important books and figures, and thank you. Absolutely fantastic. I, I, got, I got to add on something you said about Freedom Fest of Memphis. So you, you mentioned my talk about JFK, and thank you, and that's online. I mean, you can find it at fff.org. I recorded it. But Mark initially asked me to participate in a mock trial in which uh, me and Brian Kaplan, who teaches economics at, at George Mason, and a, and a lawyer named uh, Christian Bernard um, were being indicted for supporting open borders. And I, <laughs> I have to admit, I was, I was kind of skeptical of this. I says, oh my gosh, this isn't a debate. I'd prefer a debate. But as it turned out, this formula was ingenious, just absolutely ingenious. I mean, I, I'll never qu question your judgment again, Mark. It was just so entertaining, so informative. It was just fantastic, and I would recommend everybody go watch it. Um, it's online. Just do Mock Trial Freedom Fest Memphis. You'll find it absolutely masterful. So my hat's off to you, to Mark, on that one. Thank you. Okay. By the way, uh, we, uh, we do a mock trial every year, and we have a judge, and we have a prosecuting defending attorney. What I really like is when we bring on the star witnesses, and you're cross-examined, so you have an actual really good debate that is included in the mock trial. And then we have 12 jurors, uh, uh, local attendees who supposedly are unbiased and can hear both sides. And then they vote a majority rules. And it, it's, really, uh, it's really a fun event. So thank you for that. Yeah, well, I should point out that we were acquitted also. Yes, uh, I, do have one, I was I shocked do have, me too. Open I do have one beef. Kind, of, kind of won that thing. That's right. But I have a bone to pick with you on that, that you, you, those non-unanimous verdicts, that's not real due process there, Mark. I, I ask you to readjust things there. Okay, let's go to questions. Uh, from Bonita, she says, what would you all tell someone, or what would you tell someone that's starting to build their cash savings up again after getting out of debt and paying off everything, and at the same time, protect them from some, protect themselves from the oncoming economic collapse and hollowing out of the United States. Uh, well, the, yeah, you know, uh, this is the uh, doom and gloom scenario that I have resisted uh, uh, all my uh, 
my adult career since 1980, if you will, and the Reagan uh, events and so forth. And there's an old saying on Wall Street. And by the way, that's I haven't talked about my my financial books, but one of my favorites is is the the maxims of Wall Street. And I've collected all the sayings on Wall Street, like sell in May and go away and don't come back till Labor Day and stuff like that. And uh, one of them is bull markets climb a wall of worry, and we see this all the time. That no matter what time period, no matter how bullish the market is and so forth, there's always negative news out there. And so we as economists, uh, we believe in in Ray, uh, uh, looking at both sides of the issue of cost benefit analysis, if you will. And so you have to weigh the bullish and the bearish side that people are making. What I've tended to do at this stage, because I do think we're facing a lot of trouble in our country now with the return of inflation, uh, more regulation, uh, wars coming back in vogue. There's there's a lot of issues that we need to be worried about, the national debt going through the roof and so forth. So I'm, I'm my approach is to have a diversified portfolio. I think technology is still vibrant. Lots of things are being developed in uh, the Internet of Things and uh, AI and uh, electric vehicles and uh, uh, chat GBT, and you can talk about the pros and cons of all that sort of thing. But the fact is that technology is still advancing. So I'm a big supporter of uh, exchange traded funds in technology. Uh, that's my primary emphasis, and you can make a lot of money on that basis. But I also believe in uh, very conservative investments that pay dividends on a regular basis. Uh, I have a gold position. I have oil, energy stocks position. Uh, I don't think the fossil fuel uh, industry is in decline. I actually think it's uh, vibrant as ever. Uh, I've been recommending uranium for the first time in years because of the return of nuclear power. You cannot this whole idea that you can run the economy based on solar and wind is just poppycock. Uh, and when you have the nuclear power that's 8,000 times, 8,000 times more efficient than uh, fossil fuels, let alone water or uh, uh, solar and wind, uh, you can't just ignore that. They've solved the safety problems and everything. So I think there's there's really a positive thing for uranium uh, stocks. They're volatile and so forth. So there's lots of things that you can do, uh, but let's face it, if we have a major uh, where our grid collapses, what are you gonna do? I mean, you're not gonna be watching this. You're not gonna be on your cell phones. You're not gonna be able to check your financial accounts. The electricity isn't gonna work. So I understand the survival scenario there and so that's why you've got to have tools you have to have equipment you have to have food storage you have to have water you got to have guns <laughs> you got to have all of those kinds of things you just don't want to go overboard and just head for the hills and not live your life because you could have made this argument 30 years ago that we were all <laughs> going to blow ourselves up and it hasn't happened so i'm i'm a I, I believe in knowing the signs of the times. That's kind of the criteria I use for my newsletter. And uh, I try to be diversified without sounding like uh, some kind of uh, uh, nutcase where the world's coming to a hell in a handbasket. Okay. We've only got five more minutes. And so let me just uh, ask you this question. You've, you've pretty much answered it, but go ahead and, go ahead and give a short uh, addressing of it. Uh, what is your opinion of Rothbardian anarcho-capitalism versus Mises's opinion of needing government to maintain social order? So, so it's the anarchy versus limited government debate. Yes, and I've had three debates at Freedom Fest uh, with, uh, uh, with anarchists. Uh, uh, and again, I, I'm not, I don't know or which one are you, what category, I don't think we've debated, right? No, I'm on the limited government side for Okay, good, good. Uh, okay, so that's why we haven't debated. In fact, we ought to join together since, by the way, for everybody who's listening, Bumper Horberger is the best debater I have ever seen 
in the libertarian movement. And uh, we should join together and, and, and have another debate with, uh, with some of these, uh, the anarchists. Uh, I think it would be a lot of fun. But yeah, I mean, uh, there's just so many uh, examples where um, it, it just seems like a, kind of a, a waste of time to keep engaging in this debate when the big debate out there is what can we do to reduce the size of government and control of government, let alone, I mean, forget about ending uh government completely that's just not going to happen so i'm much more in the utilitarian camp in that regard okay one last question uh you you mentioned your book the making of modern economics i haven't read that i don't know whether that's a history of economic thought but if not what would you recommend is a good history of economic thought book yes that's exactly what it is it's uh, a history of economics and one of the things that i do that no other textbook has done is not only have a running plot and a hero and and uh, and judging every character based on are they building up the Adam Smith model or tearing it down, but I also include chapters that just are not in these other textbooks. For example, the French laissez-faire school of Say and Bastiat and Tocqueville. Tocqueville is often let out, left out. Uh, I have a chapter, a whole chapter on that. And of course, I cover all the Austrians. So I have Eugen von Barbrich in there and Wieser and, uh, and Schumpeter, of course, and so forth. They're, they're in, Schumpeter is in a lot of the other textbooks, but they, they give short shrift to Menger. So I, I have a whole chapter on Menger. And, uh, and, then, and then one of the favorite things that I do is right in the middle of the book, uh, I have... Uh, I have this chapter on uh, what is uh, what is what is economics all about at the turn of the century, and uh, so there's always been this critic Beblin, Thorsten Beblin, as the critic of capitalism at that time, and I said, well, who can we have at the same time who's a contemporary who is a defender of capitalism, and that's Max Weber. And Max Weber mm. is often ignored. It's ignored in all the history. It's in sociology, but it's not in economics. In my chapter, I have Weber and uh, and and Veblen duke it out. And so I have that very important chapter in there. Then I have a whole chapter on Mises and Hayek, which is often downplayed in these other textbooks. And I have a whole chapter in Chicago School, Milton Friedman called Milton's Paradise. Milton Friedman once said, all histories of economics are BS before Skousen. <laughs> so I, uh, I would like to recommend another history of thought book, but I think, I think I've, I've uh, kind of set the standard. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm going to buy it. I love history of economic thought, and I had no idea that you had written one. And one from an Austrian, I'm definitely going to buy your book and read it. Uh, sounds fantastic. We're out of time, Mark. Thank you very much for an absolute fantastic presentation. We, we couldn't have asked for anything more. Um, and next week, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for your questions. Uh, and um, I look forward to seeing you all next week. We got Larry White, professor of economics at George Mason. Fantastic Austrian, specializes in money and banking. I'm sure you all are going to enjoy that, too. So, Mark, thanks again, and uh, uh, we'll bumper, see you all next week. Bumper, yes, before, you, before you say goodbye, I want to say something I always end whenever I do my hotline and so forth. I say, uh, so long, fellow free marketeers, and remember, A-E-I-O-U. Now, if you're an Austrian, you will know what A-E-I-O-U is, and if you don't, you have to look it up. <laughs> A-E-I-O-U. A-E-I-O-U, right. -E -E I repeat it. <laughs> that, doesn't necessarily, that does not necessarily mean I know what it means. I've seen it before, but I can't yeah. put, put it together. So thank you again, Mark, and we'll My see pleasure. you all next week. All right. Thank you. Bye.